Yeah, that's my Seinfeld theme. <laughs> Sorry about the noise there. Um, what's up, TVAC fam? Happy to be here today on this beautiful Wednesday. It's nice out. Get outside. Be free. Um, I'm going to talk today about Seinfeld. Um, widely considered one of the greatest shows of all time. It was very good, I'll admit. Um, big part of my of my life, of my growing up, um, was this show, and it, you know it's. I, th I think it has earned its. Uh, its spot in that that discussion of you know great shows, um, but what I don't think is that I don't think it gets enough credit for being meaningful. You know, a lot of people just a lot of people really believe that the show about nothing tag that was. 100% a marketing tool. I mean, that's that's why it um, that's why it was sort of pushed on the public um, was to market the show for the most part. It's obviously about something. Everything's about something, guys. You didn't know, especially in television. Sometimes the things that things are about don't really matter or are trivial or who cares but everything's about something and chief among them Seinfeld I I once had a, a kid this was years ago probably like right when I started teaching so like like 15 years ago or something and I was teaching this Seinfeld and the kids were doing presentations so the kid who was doing a presentation on Seinfeld came up in front of the room and he goes, he goes, it, straight faced, like not joking. He goes, well, Seinfeld's the show about nothing, so I don't have anything to talk about. Like, pause. I'm waiting for him to go, ha <laughs> just kidding. Here's the, 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 go into his thing. No, he w took the term, the show about nothing, literally. And I'm like, dude, how? Like, how have you been taking this class this long and you still believe that? So <laughs> he did not do well on the presentation part. Um, but I think the, the culture brought into it, right? It's the first thing you think of when you think of Seinfeld. Oh, the show about nothing. It's, it's to throw you off the scent. It's 100% about things. And especially this season four. So this, this episode that we watched for class, the outing is from season four. And that was a pivotal season. If you watch the first three seasons of Seinfeld, it's not great. And it's because it's trying to be something it's not maybe that's what it is it's trying to be a regular sitcom and season four they made the creative decision to sort of try to break away from that traditional sitcom in terms of form and convention um the 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 episode, the big episode from that was the Chinese restaurant one, where the entire, you know, this was unheard of, the entire episode takes place waiting at a Chinese restaurant, like waiting to get a table, right? Um, so a lot of these episodes from season four started to change the sitcom form and what people expected from it altogether. And that was one. And this was one. Like, this was about. Like just it was it was different and self-referentiality and intertextuality 
that usually didn't happen in sitcoms where they created this, you know, timeline that wasn't completely erased at the end of every episode, you know. So they could reference characters from other episodes and and actual events from other episodes. So it really pushed the medium forward as well. Um, and this episode that we watched is about sexuality, obviously. It's sexual orientation. And that's basically what we're talking about this week, if you didn't catch that. Um, but this one, this is one of the best episodes, in my opinion, of the entire series. I love the older episodes that, you know, took the four, inter intertwined the four characters' storylines to come and meet in the end, like that format that they really kind of pioneered. Those are really fun and interesting, too. But this one, just top to bottom, is just, it, it nails so many things. And again, it's 1993. So you gotta understand what's happening. A lot of you tapped into it with your comments, like our perception of of homosexuality was different, and uh, um, but 1993, it was the PC movement was really gaining steam and becoming a thing, and. I think this, if, if everyone, I mean, I'm assuming many of you have seen Curb Your Enthusiasm, so you know Larry David's comedic sensibilities and his, you know, what bothers him and what, you know, things he likes to talk about. And PC culture is not something that Larry David uh, would probably get on board with. I think we could say that safely. So he and Jerry, you know, they were the creative catalyst for the whole show they created it they wrote a bunch of the episodes so this is about pc culture as much as it's about you know this this newly found obsession with sexuality and you know as as the lgbtq community was moving sort of was coming out of the closet basically it was moving into the public more and being more more visible more vocal and things like that like it made sense that Seinfeld would sort of you know get their hands dirty trying to wrap their heads around it in a Larry Davidian way if you will so um, I think this episode is as much Larry David's commentary on PC culture as it is about, you know, the complexities of, of this, you know, the, the emergence of um, the LGBTQ community as it was in the 90s. We had, you know, we, I don't know if we talked about it here, but Ellen, Ellen came out of the closet in 1997 in real life on Oprah, and it coincided with her character on her sitcom coming out of the closet to Oprah, who was playing her therapist. So, I mean, this is, it's really starting to move, and here's Seinfeld in 93, kind of just feeling it out, I think. And we'll get into what happened, um, or what that episode means. So, I always ask the question, and this is for anybody to answer, like, why do we care so much about sexuality? Like, especially now, everyone's hyper in tune to everybody's sexuality and wants to know who, who you're fucking. And it's, I can't think of more useless information for me to have, for, for anyone to have who's not themselves. <laughs> it's like, who I fuck shouldn't matter to anybody else but me and the person that I'm fucking, yes? Same applies to every single person. Like, it shouldn't matter. I think we're getting to a point. It matters less now, maybe, but knowing, for some reason, seems to have this odd obsession. So, it's an interesting question to dig at, 
why do we care so much? Some some people say we talked about it a little bit in class. It's innate. It's you know uh, to want to classify people and things like that. But I, I think it's I think it's more than that because growing up, even in up until the '90s and the 2000s, like it really wasn't talked about, right? And I'm not saying it it wasn't. It was a great time to be gay. I'm not saying that at all. But it wasn't on the forefront of the culture's consciousness, like everybody's sexuality. The 90s kind of ushered that in. The real world, I blame. I blame the real world for this. Um, because that the real world quickly devolved into that, you know, the seven strangers in the in this closed space. Eventually, it became... Who's the gay one? And who's the lesbian? And who's the, you know, it's like, why? Why do we have to do this on the first day? Um, so there's so much going on here. The, not that there's anything wrong with that. This is one of the most famous lines in TV history, not just Seinfeld history. And being the nerd that I am, I have all the DVDs of Seinfeld. So I watched all the DVD commentaries with Larry David and he explained in this episode that it was only supposed to be said once so the first time that that Jerry realizes that he's being accused of being gay he says not that there's anything wrong with that and that was supposed to be it but as they were shooting and doing these different takes and the, the episode unfolded Larry made the decision no, every time they are accused of being gay or the subject comes up, say not that there's anything wrong with that. And it serves as this comedic device, but it's also a critical device, I think, because it's like Lizzie said in her comment, it's exaggeration to the point of realization, right? That's the thing they're clearly exaggerating. You can almost see Jerry laughing when he's saying it eventually, right? The more elaborate it gets, not that there's anything wrong with that. People's personal sexual preferences are, you know, theirs and theirs alone, you know. Um, and that's the comment on PC culture. Like, we shouldn't have to say this every single time because it's pretty clear, I think, that Jerry and George aren't homophobic in this episode. But it's also very clear that they are being misrepresented. So like, I think Ina and a couple other people mentioned this. Like Chris talks about it a little bit in his comment. No one wants to be misrepresented. So where is the line between, you know, being firm about who you are and like, no, I'm not that and being homophobic, right? Um, Lizzie mentioned that too. They don't want either label. They don't want to be labeled as homosexual because they're not. I don't think they are, I don't think they're demeaning gay people by not wanting to be called that. Right? You, you feel me? They don't want to be homophobic, but they also don't want to be they don't want to be homosexual, but they also don't want to be homophobic. So how hard you fight kind of has nothing to do with whether you agree with it or not. It's just sort of, it's about representation here. Um, so it, you can see how it kind of gets dicey pretty quickly. Now, I think George and Jerry react very differently. And I think that shows the range of um, reactions. Like, Jerry doesn't seem bothered by the accusation or the assumption that he's gay. He gets it all the time, right? Single thin meat, like all that stuff. So he seems fine with it. George is the one who's, whose verbal reaction doesn't match his physical, right? George is adamant that he is not gay. Like he's jumping around, he's screaming. Um, you want to have sex right now? I'll have sex with you right now, right? Like, he is frantic. So, George is used to represent this idea that 
you can say all the right things and mean none of them. And that's part of PC. That's part of Larry's PC culture criticism is like George clearly represents this uh, this dichotomy of he's clearly upset about it, but he's saying all the right things. So if anyone's homophobic in this episode, it's George, right? Because his words don't match his actions. He wouldn't be freaking out this way if, you know, if he didn't really have a problem with it, right? So he's saying not that there's anything wrong with that. And as if that sort of covers his ass, basically, right? Using words, you know, you can say, you can say a lot of things and not believe any of it. And there's a lot of people like that who use the PC language and PC culture to, to sort of, to hide their sort of prejudices. And, and uh, that's almost as duplicitous and devious as the, just the outright bigot or the outright homophobe or racist or whatever it is. Um, the people who just disguise it better and, and mask it with saying, by saying the right thing, you know, um, and that's what PC culture is all about. It's about knowing the right things to say. Well, okay, are you, are you saying the right thing or what you need to say to cover your ass? Or are you saying it because you're an ally and an advocate, right? I think you kind of see, you see that playing out in this episode. Um, a couple of you mentioned the generational reaction, right? Um, George's mom thinks his life is over, basically. But the, the, the better one is Jerry's parents, right? Assuming that homosexuality can be determined by a pair of culottes that you bought him from the girls' department. Like, the, that made him gay. And so it shows some progression in how we understand homosexuality. Right? Like, that is laughed off as just ridiculous, right? Like, it's not about the clothes you wear, and you didn't turn gay because your mom bought you a pair of questionable pants, right? Um, but Jerry's dad thinks it, like, he's convinced, you know? Um, so it shows that generational sort of, I guess, growth. Um, but just sort of how archaic uh, notions of homosexuality were at the time. Um, for me, this episode comes down to, um, um, among other things, the same thing you talked about with who's the boss, right? Their relationship, Tony and Angela's relationship is fine. They're happy. They're coexisting. They're basically equals in that household until the maids from the neighborhood come over and they say, oh, this is not right, Tony, you need to do this, and she thinks you're the maid, and you need to, you know, be the boss, like, whatever it is, be the boss. And I made the point then that most of us are living happy lives and content with our decisions and our choices and our identities until the culture at large points at us and says that it's not okay or it's not right or it's, you know, it doesn't look right, it doesn't sound right, there's something weird about it, it's not normal, whatever it is. Um, and here, that's what's happening here, right? All the things... There are all these markers of sexuality in the show that aren't funny until the culture says that they are. Does this make sense? Follow me. Um, the Bette Midler CDs, the tickets to Guys and Dolls, the George worried about his voice on tape, it's so high and whiny, the shirt, is this a good shirt? Jerry says it's terrible. The washing of the pair. 
right? All these, all these things, they weren't funny until we realized that the joke, and we realize, the audience realizes why they're supposed to be funny. Because, but we didn't think they were. Like when he says, oh, I got Jerry tickets to Guys and Dolls before the whole controversy. Nobody laughs at that. Nobody assumes that that's that they're gay until the culture says it, right? And once the culture, meaning the reporter who writes this story, now everything changes and we start to think back and be like, oh my God, well, is this gay? Is this gay? Is this gay? Or whatever it is. And it, it sort of climaxes when Kramer comes in and he's so offended that Jerry never told him. He, he immediately believes it. He's like, he's like, you fit the type, right? Single theme, late 30s. And then when Jerry says, so are you, that blows Kramer's mind. Because he's like, holy shit. Now, he knows that he's not gay, right? And it totally blows his mind. Like, oh, like that's where you're supposed to make this connection. Right until the culture points at you and says that or defines you or says that what you're doing is wrong, we're generally pretty happy people. Um, so that's so interesting. The, the Kramer thing, I mean, Kramer's like, Whoa, you just blew my mind right there, right. Jerry's like, yeah, see how stupid it is, right? Like, see how trivial or arbitrary it is? Um, yeah, so how the culture shapes our choices and actions, right? His voice being high and whiny, um, the shirt, the pair argument, taking a steam, right? Kramer comes in, I thought we were going to take a steam, and they're like, well, we can't do that anymore, because now everyone thinks we're gay, right, um, Bette Midler CDs, the Guys and Dolls tickets, like, that whole thing is immediately reframed, but only, and that's, I think they did it pretty brilliantly with the audience is in on this joke, the, we're the only ones in on the joke basically um, and that's you know that's just it's it's so good um, then at the end right this is this is a typical thing that's in line with the whole PC culture George realizes that being gay can help him get out of this relationship that he doesn't want to be in anymore so he goes, he immediately adopts, he's like, oh, no, I'm gay. Like, embraces it when he can benefit from it, right? Um, George is gay when it suits him and he can benefit from it. And that's a whole, it's a whole other avenue that the show can, takes you down. Um, especially this is talking about, you know, again, sexuality in the 90s. It was... Uh, it was a, you know, it was a fucked up time. Let's let's put it that way. Um, and I just I, I think a lot of this gets lost again because it's all it was part of the show about nothing. Um, but it's about things, guys. Um, what else do I have here? Oh, that was another thing that a bunch of you mentioned. We talked about it in class, like the 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 reporter when she puts it together, she's like, "Oh, this is the story, right? Their sexuality, Jerry's sexuality, is the story," and she runs with that, right? Um, and she becomes obsessed with it. Forget about 
comedian or whatever she was doing the story for in the first place, like that, I think, is a marker of this idea that, you know, we're becoming more obsessed with it, right? Um, for whatever reason it might be. Um, I think that's, I feel like I'm forgetting something, some part. Um, Awana, so I just mentioned your her point, how the reporter chooses uh, to focus on Jerry's sexuality as the story now, not anything else. Um, Tom, Tom Rogers also sort of hinted at that, like, like was talking about that idea and how that's indicative of, I think, the culture in the 90s. Um, Andrea, <laughs> I just liked, yeah, there's a dog just screaming on his phone outside the window. Um, I loved the, it made me feel like an adult to watch Seinfeld as a kid. Um, yeah, that was cute. I like that. Um, and I mentioned, I mentioned your point about how everyone reacted to this news, right? Specifically, George's, George and Jerry's parents, like that generational sort of gap in understanding. Um, but there's a little Seinfeld nugget. If you know the show, the master of your domain episodes where they have the mass the masturbation contest anti-masturbate see who can go longest without masturbating contest um there's the scene in the hospital with george and his mother and the two guys sponge bathing from this episode there's the exact scene almost word for word with two women giving themselves a sponge bath behind the curtain sitting right next to him so that's that's the kind of shit I was talking about at the beginning that Seinfeld started to do. It was like, you'd never, you'd never seen that stuff in the sitcom before. Just like self-referentiality and intertext, stuff like that. Um, Chris talked about it, and a, bunch, a bunch of you did. Lizzie, too, this whole idea of Ina, like, Nobody wants to be misrepresented, but where's the line between just, you know, being seen for who you are, for real, and being, you know, homophobic or whatever it is? Because um, it's, it's also not right for Jerry and George to just be like, eh, people think we're gay. Well, who cares? I mean, who cares? Yes, but in this situation, you know, nobody wants to, like, they're not, we aren't, like, that. and it is, it's a complicated sort of, it's a complicated uh, predicament to be in, um, and I liked how Lizzie put it, like, they don't want, they don't want to, nobody wants to be labeled, period. But they don't want either label homophobic or homosexual. So I guess, you know, that's something this episode brings up. Like, where's the line between being a bigot and just being, you know, accurately represented, right? Um, yeah, I think that's an, that's an interesting concept to to be talking about in 1993, too. Um, Lizzie, you know too well how I like being quoted back to myself, so your exaggeration to the point of realization is, is perfect usage. Um, yes, that, the, not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, Larry David basically has said, like, yes, we were making a point, right? <laughs> we were making a point about, you know, 
PC culture and and political correctness in general, specifically with uh, language, and you know why do we have to say that? we shouldn't have to say this every time? But he's like, we better say it every time, right? So sort of, and then calling into question the uh, veracity of PC language and culture, like. Are we using it the way George uses it, right? To just say the right thing without meaning it. Um, that's fundamental to the success of any uh, of, of PC culture. Is you got to believe the stuff you're saying. You can't just be saying it to protect yourself. Right? But you should be saying it to protect others, I guess. And Amanda, the earring thing, that shot of the, you know, the coffee shop guy, and that very odd just one shot of him turning slowly and showing the ear, I don't, I don't have an answer. It has perplexed me as long as I've... <laughs> As long as that episode has existed, since 1993, I've wondered about it. And no, you're not looking at it too deeply. There's, It seems deliberate, right? Um, so I, I, I wish I could, I wish I could help you more than that, but. Uh, Sorry. Um, all right, guys. Thanks for playing. <clears throat>